Hi, and welcome to The Kindled Podcast, where we dig into the art and science behind kindling the motivation, curiosity, and mental well-being of the young humans in our lives. Together, we'll discover practical tools and strategies you can use to help kids unlock their full potential and become the strongest version of their future selves. today. Good. How are you, Katie? So great. Excited for our topic today. Yeah, I'm sure you are. We're talking about literacy. And honestly, when you told me we were going to be talking about this, I was a little scared because I don't know a ton, but I have been listening to some podcasts and learning about (laughs) literacy and all the buzzwords in that world to, to hopefully be able to talk to you about it today. But as I was thinking about literacy and kids learning how to read. And I do have a six-year-old who is just learning how to read himself. I was thinking about when I learned how to read. Do you remember learning? Yeah. So I remember it was like in California in the 90s. And I actually have memories of my mom talking about me learning how to read. Um, And it was not easy for me. I was always a really slow reader. And I had siblings who were kind of, I had some siblings who are like really like almost gifted, I'd say, and then others that had special needs. So like my mom was used to managing a wide range of skills and she herself was an English teacher. I'll share a story about that. That's really meaningful to me because it's coming to my mind right now. So my mom was an English teacher in Oakland in the 1960s. And there was a really heavy culture of standardized testing in the schools, but she was teaching, I think, sorry, if I get this wrong, mom, I think it was like eighth grade English. Um, She was supposed to be talking about literature and things like this, but none of the kids could read. And so a lot of the other teachers the whole year just focused on teaching them the answers to the test. And my mom chose to ignore all of the curriculum. (laughs) You can see where I get my my educational (laughs) craziness. Um, She just taught them how to read instead. And so she focused on what they needed and not really like what she was maybe quote unquote supposed to teach them. And they did not score great on that literature based standardized test, but they had a skill. And so literacy was a huge part of growing up. My mom was constantly reading out loud to us, but that's, that didn't necessarily mean that it was super easy for me. I always had this perception of myself that I was a slow reader. I have lots of memories of my mom reading all the books that I was supposed to read myself out loud (laughs) the night before my book report was due to help me. (laughs) And I, I do remember being in a kindergarten or first grade class and going around and doing a little like phonics hunt um, and things like that. But I, other than that, I just remember not feeling great about myself as a reader. Were you able to comprehend when she read to you? Yeah, that part was fine. It was like the decoding skill, which we're going to talk about. What about you? How did you learn how to read? As you were talking, I was thinking about a few other things too. I do remember being in first grade And I don't really remember learning how to read in kindergarten. I'm sure we (laughs) learned letters and sounds. I don't remember that part at all. But in first grade, the only reason why I have this really strong memory about learning how to read is because I didn't get put in the highest group. We got separated into groups. And I remember feeling like, like I need to be in the highest group. So I stole our readers. (laughs) I stole our book. And I took it home. We weren't allowed to take, which is silly that we weren't allowed to take our books home, but I took it and I wonder if it's still in my dad's house. It might be, but I took it home and just memorized it to the point where I was thinking I was reading, but I memorized it. And then I think though I did start picking up because I would follow with my finger along. And then at home, I don't remember really having many books and I had one book and I actually still have it. Uh, in our house and it is like falling apart. And it was a lot of nursery rhymes, those old school, really hilarious nurse- nursery rhymes that you, you kind of think back, you're like, what are they even talking about? I had memorized all of those. And then I thought I was reading. So those are my two big memories about learning how to read. I also remember one time I thought I figured out how to read in my head, like read silently. And I was just like inhaling and exhaling every time I saw a word. So I wasn't even, I was just like, and I thought I was reading in my head 
<laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. As we already mentioned, we are going to talk about literacy today. So Katie, why should we even be talking about this Yeah, topic? that's a great question. So literacy is something, well, illiteracy actually has been in the news a lot lately. And that's because just a few months ago, our NAEP scores came out. It's like, if you haven't heard of NAEP, it's like uh, our nation's report card on education. So they look at all the standardized tests across the states from fourth grade, eighth grade, and 12th grade, and they kind of use it to gauge the health of our educational system based on how kids are doing at those kind of mileposts. And it's not good, guys. Uh, I'll just like read you some of the stats so you can feel the weight and sadness of this yourself. Uh, 32% of fourth graders in America are reading proficiently. That's only a third of kids are proficient readers. 29% 29%, wow. 29% of eighth graders are reading proficiently. So under a third of kids. So this means that two thirds of the kids in our schools are struggling in reading. And it would be really easy to say like, well, we, they're coming through a pandemic. This is just pandemic learning loss. I looked at the stats throughout the whole, like the whole history of the test. We've never gotten, like the highest I saw was maybe like 35% of kids hitting proficiency. Um, so we've, as a country, despite pandemics or trends in curriculum or any legislation we've passed, really never been able to move this number super significantly. And another thing that they ask kids is how often do you read for fun? And in 2012, this was 27% of kids reported that they read for fun, occasionally at least. And in 2023, it was 14%. So not only can we not read, those that can read aren't reading. So that's why we want to talk about literacy today. Because how do you learn anything? So what has caused this? Why do you think we as a nation have never been able to get more than a third? It's really interesting. We've actually been fighting about this as a body of educators, people, adults in the United States trying to get kids to read for the last like 70 years, honestly. it's been so pervasive this battle about what's the right way to teach someone how to read that it's actually called the reading wars and we just go back and forth like playing tennis this is the best way no this is the best way and I had an interesting experience when I was like 15 I didn't know any of this but I I remember walking through the quad in my high school and for some reason I just had this thought why have we not figured out the best way to teach someone how to read like we've been reading for who knows how long right And why have we not found the best way? And that question just kind of always ate at my brain (laughs) until later where I've been able to in my life kind of start to move the needle on this metric of illiteracy. So yeah, the podcast I was listening to this morning, they were kind of getting into that battle a little bit too, or the host was talking about how, can you believe people still teach a letter a week? Why are we still teaching a letter a week? And I was like, well, that's how, I mean, my son just went through preschool and he was still doing a letter a week, but they were like flabbergasted that this is still going on. So it's just really interesting. And, and especially because there's all this new and cutting research and then we are still doing things that we did in the forties and fifties. So I'm sure that is contributing to this challenge for sure. And this, what you're called calling the reading wars. I've never heard of that. So can you break down the different theories behind literacy instruction that people have been fighting over? So there's kind of two sides to the reading words, the reading wars, Uh, a whole language or whole word learning versus phonics. So Phonics is the idea that all of the little shapes that we call letters make sounds. You put those sounds together, they make words. Words have meaning. That's kind of phonics. Whole language or whole word reading is that good readers don't actually sound words out. When you're a good reader, you're perceiving words at the word level. So your eyes just go onto the word and your brain perceives the word as a whole and tells you the meaning of the word. So you're kind of they're, they use a lot of sight word memorization and like word shape kind of approaches um, instead of breaking the word all the way down into its components, component parts like you do in a phonics approach. And the argument is that the whole language people will say, 
phonics is boring. You're going to, you're killing their love of learning. And if you just read out loud to them and provide a print rich environment, kids will figure it out. The brains, the brain will, will figure out the patterns and we don't need to waste all of our time um, doing all this phonics. And actually in the twenties and thirties and forties, when this battle was gearing up, they were actually saying things like, we only have to resort to phonics when someone has a severe cognitive issue. Like it's just for like the very like lowest of intellect type people. So it was really shunned. Like, oh, I don't need to use phonics because now it has the stigma associated with it. Like I'm a good reader. I'm going to read whole words. And they actually, there were these two men who were really successful at teaching deaf people how to read by using this whole word approach. And they got really popular and they thought, oh, if it's working for deaf kids, surely it will work for everyone else. So they took what they were uh, applying in the deaf schools and applied it to people, to kids, to hearing kids. And that doesn't make any sense to my brain at all. (laughs) Why that was, why that happened. Um, But I think that's kind of how it started anyways. And so phonics, the phonics branch of the argument says that if you don't teach kids how to decode words, then they're always going to be guessing and relying on other people to tell them what the word is initially. It it breeds a kind of dependency. Um, So in more recent years, a lot of these whole language folks in the 70s and 80s have kind of come to the middle because it's like, well, yeah, they do need to know the basics. They do need to know what the letters say and things like that. So they invented this thing called balanced literacy, which is a lot of whole language approaches with some phonics kind of sprinkled in. So you feel like you're getting the best of both worlds. Um, Like 72% of kids or schools in the United States use a balanced literacy approach. And it is like the, the normalist, most common kind of approach. It's what teachers learn in teacher colleges. It's what um, all of the curriculum is kind of um, geared around providing this balanced literacy approach. But when I look at that number, I think, wow, that number is really close to two thirds, to 66%, the number of kids who can't read in America. (laughs) And so my, I am definitely, like you don't have to choose one side of this, but I am definitely like a phonics, advocate, I would say, Um, because I think it's, we've swung really far towards the whole language in our schools. And so I think um, we need to come back towards the middle a little bit and actually a lot of it and really teach some deep phonics. And that doesn't mean we're going to let go of a love of literature or print exposure or anything like that. And we'll get into that super deep, but that's kind of an overview of the reading wars. Yeah, a lot was coming up for me as you were talking. And one is, well, can't the phonics lead into the whole world word? Because if the thought was, oh, well, they didn't know what the word means. It's like, okay, but if you start to sound it out, you eventually get to a place where you can read whole word. That's, you know, my 11 year old keeps telling me things like, I just glance at a page and I just know what it says. <laughs> and But he started out, he went to a school that taught phonograms, phonograms. I don't know how to pronounce that. And they did no sight words and no whole. And he learned how to read so quickly. And I know he does have a differently wired brain and he is gifted. And But it was incredible how fast he and my oldest learn how to read. And now my youngest is, they're using more of this balanced literacy approach. And it's taking him a lot longer to learn how to read. So I'm really curious. It's almost like I have my own experiment going on in my house and just to see how his skills end up unfolding because my two older ones are extremely strong readers and comprehenders. And I know that's a whole piece of this too. It's like, okay, learning how to read and decode the words, but then we have comprehension, which is a whole nother. Yeah. So we, you've stumbled on the absolute truth of this matter is that we, when, when the whole language um, folks were kind of originating this, this strategy or this approach, they looked at what good readers do, but that's not, doesn't mean just because that's what good readers do or are capable of, that doesn't mean that that's how they became good readers. And that's the gap is that those good readers had a strong foundation in phonics. 
So much so that their brains ha can do those phonics operations, essentially, it's like, kind of like math, um, so quickly that it doesn't feel like they're processing that at the phoneme, the, the letter level. Um, and after you've read a word a hundred times, you it does become a sight word to you. You don't have to sound out the words. And that's, of course, what we're trying to accomplish when we teach and train sight words is this automaticity, this fluency that we're trying to get to. And we kind of have this myth or this um, unsubstantiated belief that the way to get to fluent reading is to memorize and to have a lot of sight words in your um, repertoire. But actually, that's not the, the right path to getting to that end, the, the right path. And now we, we, we show there's a whole body of research that is very popular right now um, called the science of reading. And that clearly shows that the key to strong reading is a strong foundation in phonics and understanding the real rules of English and how words are put together in their component parts. And then once you're really good at that, it becomes, you, you get more and more fluent. And then you do have this um, effect where you can skim or read or comprehend at the word level, which is great. Yeah. A quote I heard this morning that I thought was kind of fun is all words aspire to be sight words when they grow up. <laughs> Because it's like, who, why do we decide <laughs> what is a sight word or not? And also what I'm hearing you say is I need to pull those phonograms out and start working with my youngest now. <laughs> and I'm sure our listeners are thinking, okay, what is the solution? How should we be thinking about this? Right. Yeah. So this issue in literacy can be super overwhelming, especially if you're a parent homeschooling a child and you're now responsible for their literacy education, or if you are watching your child struggle learning to read um, in a balanced literacy program, and just you're probably thinking like, what can I do? And it really, we want to pull back from all of the detail, like what curriculum, what all of the things you can do to understand the component parts of reading. Because once you see this, it becomes really simple. Um, so in the 80s, there was a theory put forth that no one's been able to disprove. This is really like rock solid uh, research. It's called the simple view of reading. And it's actually a math equation. Um, and it goes something, it's hard to like verbalize math, but it's essentially your decoding skills, your ability to sound words out multiplied by your language comprehension, your ability to understand language as it's spoken. So it doesn't have anything, this, this form of comprehension, we're not talking about reading comprehension. We're just talking about your vocabulary, your ability to understand complex sentence structures, questions, things like that. So you have your decoding ability and your language comprehension, the product of those two things, you have to multiply them. Um, and that equals reading comprehension. So if we plug in some um, numbers here, if... If one is, yes, I have the skill, and zero is, I don't have the skill. If I have a zero for decoding, but a one for language comprehension, zero times one is zero, so we don't have reading comprehension. If I have strong decoding skills, but I don't have language comprehension, one times zero, still zero, I still don't have reading comprehension. So the solution to the reading wars is, it's absolutely both. And we have to be giving kids a foundation of language comprehension where we're reading to them and helping them fall in love with story, which we'll talk more about later. And then layering on this deep phonetic knowledge. And when we have both of those things, we see what's happening with your son. We see strong reading comprehension and it, it, it shouldn't be very effortful when we have both of these parts. So that's the simple view of reading. And anytime I'm looking at evaluating a child for any sort of reading issue, those are the buckets that my mind goes to. How are our decoding skills? What's our language comprehension like? And what about the age and the how old the brain is? Does that matter? So is there a window of when this is, we need to make sure that we're getting these skills <laughs> developed and established? Yeah, there's definitely more neuroplasticity between the ages of zero and four. But that doesn't mean it's ever too late to read, for sure. You can always learn. You can always figure this out. If we don't capitalize on this, on developing these skills in those early years, um, I'd say like through third grade, the, the research shows that it's significantly harder to catch up. But um, I would suggest that the research is only looking at kids in balanced literacy programs where it is very hard 
to catch up when no one's teaching you um, the piece of the component of the equation that you're actually missing. So um, I don't think it's ever too late, but we do want to capture this kind of neural early development neural plasticity for sure. So how can parents know if their kids are in these programs or what kind of program their kids are in and what can they do about it? Yeah, we'll definitely talk to your kid's teacher, but some clues that you can, you can see um, if your teacher is, <laughs> if you're reading with your child at home and they're trying to use a strategy like looking at a picture and then guessing, kids will do that naturally. But when you are hearing the teacher teach them that as a um, strategy, that's a big red flag. That's part of something called three queuing, which has been completely disproven, but is used in a lot of schools where it's like, you don't know what word is you look at the picture, you ask yourself, does it sound right? Like th there are all these kind of like vague questions you ask yourself and you never get to what do the letters say? So that's an important element. Um, if your teacher, if you, if you feel concerned about your child's literacy development and your teacher saying things like just read out loud to them, they'll figure it out. That's kind of a product of this way of thinking. Um, and then the third one I'd say is your kids are coming home with long lists of sight words. And then when you read those sight words, they're things like read, not, yes, like very easily decodable. They're not exceptions to the rules. They're, they're just very easily decodable. That's another signal that they're in a balanced literacy program. That's interesting because when my kids were learning how to read, I was actually feeling a little ashamed that they didn't have long <laughs> lists of sight words. And now, I mean, like I said, though, their reading skills are absolutely incredible. And we are using, I know we're going to talk a little bit about treasure hunt reading, but we do use that at home a little bit um, just because, you know, we have access to it with me working at Brenda and I love it for him. And then he is also doing his blended. So we're doing a little bit of everything as he's learning how to read and we read aloud a lot. That's super important. I would love to know then, why do you think so many schools and districts use this approach when it's not working yeah, for very sure. well? Um, one, it's not their fault. They've been, as Emily Hanford says, sold a story, which is, if you have not heard of Emily Hanford's podcast, if you have not listened to this, sold a story, and you have, I'm going to say, like anyone in elementary school or anyone who's struggling with reading, um, get your hands on that podcast. We'll link it in the show notes. She goes through a really deep history of why it's like this. Um, so I'd highly recommend that to everyone. It's only six episodes long and it's just like so good. Um, but essentially teaching this deep phonics is hard. It's complicated, or at least it feels complicated. And so it requires an instructor that has studied pretty intensively um, and teachers aren't given this instruction in teacher colleges. They're prepared to do something that's closer to balanced literacy. And if you want to become um, like certified or have some sort of additional training in phonics, you have to seek that outside of your of the typical like teacher degree. Um, so unless you happen to work for like a back to basics charter school, you'll see phonics based approaches used um, in that type of a school pretty often lots of private schools use them that's kind of the why it's <laughs> the research that we have had has not been fully understood and applied in the curriculum and then we've had some really powerful curriculum sales people essentially um sell into the schools and once a school um, adopts a curriculum it's really hard for them to then like reinvest in something else and be changing their curriculum a lot that's hard on teachers so just kind of found balanced literacy and that's what's taught in teacher colleges and that's what's available on the market. So that's what most people use. So then that's the decoding piece, but then the language comprehension piece really takes a parent creating a rich language environment at home from the time a child's a baby, because this lays the foundation of vocabulary and background knowledge about the world, which actually has a ton to do with your language comprehension, therefore your reading comprehension. Um, so it's definitely a school thing, but it's also a home thing where we need to be upping the language in the home, reading out loud more, talking to our kids more. So there's, it's not just like a thing where you have to wait till your school, your teacher, or your school fixes this. There's so much you can do at home too, to prepare the child's mind to be able to read when it's time. 
as you're talking, I'm thinking about what if there is a teacher, a reading specialist, or someone out there that's like, nope, no, this is how you, it actually does work. So it's like, I'm sure, I mean, you can find two sides to everything, right? So where exactly is this research coming from? Or how do you know that this really is the right way, Katie? If you look at the science of reading research, there are five different components of a strong reading program, which you'll see are missing in the balanced literacy approach. So the five pieces of this science of reading are phonemic awareness, which means that my brain understands that sounds can blend together and come apart and I can move sounds around. And that has a direct effect on the meaning of a word, which is a, you don't have to know any letters to be good at this. This is like a pre-reading skill. The second one is phonics, understanding how, like the rules, the mechanics of how letters go together, how sounds change when they're influenced by certain word patterns and things like that, Um, which in balanced literacy, we definitely get a a little bit of phonics where we'll we'll teach the letter sounds, we'll teach that CH says ch, but we don't learn about open syllables and different syllable types and um, all of these deeper phonics level things, which are really missing. Fluency, which is the ability to read smoothly and accurately. Again, what we see in a balanced literacy approach, they might talk about fluency, but they're really doing like time training drills with these kids. They're timing them to see how many words a minute that they can read and getting to that skill by just practicing speed reading, like trying to go as fast as possible, memorizing things. Um, When in fact, fluency is a product of strong phonics knowledge and language comprehension and practice. Um, So it's kind of like a result we want to monitor and give an opportunity for development for, but we don't have to get there by doing like reading time trials, vocabulary, and then comprehension. So those are the last two. Those ones are pretty self-explanatory. Do those build upon themselves or is it kind of all encompassing or it's like, okay, we tackle this skill and then we go on yeah, to the Yeah, they next? definitely build, but they can be built in parallel. So um, pho- phonemic awareness, that starts as soon as a baby hears the mom talking to him in the womb, like that, that, that starts their phonemic awareness, right? We can develop that to more advanced levels. Um, to prepare that brain to read and to really be able to manipulate sounds later, um, or we cannot. That's our choice um, through the first few years of life. But then you don't want to introduce phonics until a kid is like five or six, but that doesn't mean we're not going to teach him any words. He's going to be gaining vocabulary knowledge and language comprehension skills from the time he's born, right? So they do build, but they also layer, I would say. Thinking about a friend who her son has PANS, it's a neurological disorder, and they have been working so hard to just even recognize the letters. And it's interesting. I mean, she's been working with specialists. She's homeschooling him. He's now 10 or 11, and he can recognize certain letters, but not others. And almost all the letters in his name except for one. And it, she, he just, there's something not clicking. And so we are talking about that there's something just not firing in the brain. So I'm just really curious of, that's why I asked if they build upon themselves. Cause it's like, can he get to those, those other levels of comprehension and, and learning if he doesn't even recognize or can't even decode what the letter, what sound the letter is making? Yeah, that's a really good point. And we know that about 5% of kids are going to struggle with literacy long-term due to these cognitive issues like PANS um, and many others. But in order for them to have a chance at learning how to read, we have to take this approach. If we put put your friend's son in a balanced literacy program, he would, I would almost guarantee not have made any of the progress that we are at least seeing with him. So it's your best shot. And that doesn't mean that anyone and it doesn't mean that this is like a foolproof way to teach every single human how to read. There are always going to be these little things and difficulties and individual um, quirks and challenges, of course. And I can give some statistics on that if you're interested. Sure. Yeah. So there are different approaches to reading, obviously. And lots of people have really strong opinions about this because of we kind of have our own experience learning to read and then watching maybe a couple of kids learn how to read if we're a parent And we use our experience to form really strong opinions instead of looking at wide swaths of kids, like hundreds and thousands and millions of data points, um, which is what we really need to do when we evaluate this kind of thing. So um, there's kind of some myths um, that if you just 
ha make this, this is kind of like the whole word learning, whole language approach myth that kids will just figure literacy out, even if you don't teach them anything. Uh, this is also called organic literacy, and it definitely works. Research shows that it works for 30% of kids. So that's a big chunk of kids that are like our brains are just hardwired to see patterns. And if we are creating an environment where it is print, print bridge, we have a model of an adult in our life that is reading, showing us the ropes a little bit, um, reading out loud to us. We have strong language comprehension. We can figure out literacy. But when you learn to read like that, you can't really, you don't really know what you know. So you can definitely read the word and you can understand it, but I can't, I can't talk to a kid that's learned to read that way and be like, Hey, why does the sound make this sound in this word? Right. It's like an organic skill that the brain knows, but like the cognitive brain doesn't know. So you can't kind of limits your ability. Um, sometimes these kids are not very good spellers. Sometimes they have, they are good spellers because they're so into, they, they have really good picture memory, essentially, like words are pictures to them. And that's a certain type of brain, but it's only like if we had a disease and 30% of people got better from it naturally, we would still want to treat the other 70% of people, right? We wouldn't be like, oh, we don't need to solve this because some people get better by themselves, right? Um, so then looking at that remaining 70%, 50% of kids will figure out how to read if we give them this high quality literacy instruction. 15% will need additional help past that strong foundation in this instruction. And then 5% will always struggle due to some sort of cognitive issue. And I'm not including dyslexia in that. Um, dyslexia is a phonological issue in the brain that can absolutely be, it's not, I'm not saying that suddenly you won't struggle with this, but through this approach, dys kids with dyslexia or dyslexia, dyslexic like tendencies absolutely can become strong readers through this approach. Wow. This is all so fascinating to me. And it makes sense of where we started in this podcast of understanding or realizing, okay, only a look at these statistics of kids not having freedom reading proficiency, it totally makes sense. Yeah. So according to the statistics I just shared, if 30% of kids are going to figure it out no matter what, and 50% of kids will figure it out if they're given strong reading instruction, that's 80% of kids that should be scoring proficient, right? So that shows us that this, this 50% that we're trying to target with this tier one, like high quality instruction, they're not getting that. And that's why we have two thirds of kids that can't read the third, 30, 30% ish they're figuring it out and the rest are not being taught, which is really sad. It is sad. And so we have the challenge of kids not learning how to read, but then we have this other challenge of them not loving reading and not wanting to read. And I can see how our culture is really contributing to this with, you know, our attention spans are shortening, our quality of stories are declining. And I was reading something recently about how it is just not good for our brains to skim. And we are in the culture of skimming. And I catch myself doing that all the time. Honestly, we have two laser printers and I'm so thankful. I print everything out. I am so old school because I can't read on an iPhone or a computer, it just is really hard for me. So I find myself just finding the bolded words and finding the subtitles and just skimming through. And it's really hard for the brain to create this cohere cohesive narrative or really understand what you're reading. And I read too how I read that you should really read it, digest it, and think about what you read. Don't just move on. That is not you our have like culture. A very go, go, go. Like so, you have to process that information as fast as possible and then be on to something else, right? Absolutely. So what do you see as the most important elements of getting this right? I'd say there are two or three things. One, how we teach reading, both in technical instruction and then culturally, or like our beliefs about literacy. And we'll, I'll go into that. And then how we use story. So the first part of this, um, I think we've pretty we've covered pretty well. We're pretty much teaching kids how to read in a way that makes it impossible, nearly, 
for them to actually become competent readers. And it's funny to me when I hear someone say that they love to read, they don't actually love the act of reading. They love what reading does for them, right? They love the story. They love that it relaxes their brain. They love that they are learning new things. They learn that, um, or they love that they are learning a cool self-help thing that's going to bring them more peace in their relationships or something like that. No one's like, "Mm, I just want to go decode some words. I just want to read, right? So, um, but that's kind of how we treat literacy instruction. And I love this analogy that comes from Marlene Peterson. She's one of my education heroes. She started this thing called the Well-Educated Heart, Libraries of Hope. It's all about heart-based instruction through story. And it's amazing. We'll link it in the show notes. Um, But she has this analogy about chocolate cake. So if I invited Adrienne over to my house for dessert, and then I showed, I, I served her a tablespoon of salt, some baker's chocolate, some vinegar, some flour, and I put that out in front of you, you'd be like, thanks for inviting me to your house, Katie. I'm definitely going to come back here next time you invite me, right? You'd be like, no, this is gross. What are you doing? Get this out of my face. I'm never coming back again, right? But if I mix all those things up and I bake a chocolate cake out of those things, Adrian's going to be like, oh, this is amazing. I cannot wait to come to your house again. Like, I just am looking forward to this. This was so yummy. Um, and that's what we do with literacy. We don't start with story. We don't start with those results that are actually driving us to quote unquote love reading. What we start with is the component parts. This is a letter. This is a sound. This is a comma. This is a period. We break it all up so it's not fun. And then we're so shocked when kids are like, I hate this. Like this is work and I don't want to do this. And then because we presented it, it, it's like if I presented all those ingredients to Adrian and she's like, I hate chocolate cake. I was like, girl, you don't have never even had chocolate cake. You don't even know what you're missing over here because no one's ever given you the opportunity to fall in love with it before, right? So we, we need to lead with story and the access, eventually kids will fall in love with story and they'll, remember we were talking about language comprehension, right? So this falling in love with story is also developing their language comprehension. And then they're going to not want to go decode words. They're not going to cozy up with some hot chocolate to decode words. They're going to go cozy up with some hot chocolate and get a good story. And it's access to that story and independent access. Like, I don't need my mom to read to me. I'm just going to go do this on my own time. My mom's busy. She's doing the dishes, whatever. I'm going to go read. Um, That's what drives kids to love how to read. But we've gotten this backwards. We put a bad taste in their mouth, literally, for reading. When we decided to homeschool, we found this. My son went from traditional school to a micro school to a traditional school again <laughs> to homeschool. And so I started researching all the different curriculums and philosophies and all the different ways you can homeschool. And we landed on Charlotte Mason. And the reason why is because of the living books. Everything he does is story. He is reading. He's not just, even the curriculum that they use for grammar is so much fun. And I, this summer was just reading it to my six-year-old while he was in the bathtub. And just yesterday he was like, act like you're the pie maker. And it was the way they were teaching about, um, I forget Jaren's and, and he like totally was connecting it because it was a story about this pie maker and being funny and not knowing he was, and he was saying like the opposites instead of above and below I don't remember exactly the details of it, but he does. And that's what's really important. And so, yes, what you're describing is exactly what I'm seeing in my house as well. And just these books that my son is reading through his, uh, we're using, it's called Alviary. And it's just phenomenal. Uh, All these stories, instead of just learning about physics, like he's reading about these people's lives and how they apply it. And, and I am seeing that he's then loving to learn, read his school books instead of these textbooks. Cause we started with textbooks and he was not interested in them at all. But as soon as we moved to living books, he was extremely interested. I have loved that concept. The opposite of a a living book in Charlotte Mason is called twaddle, which I think is just a fun word. And it's fun to teach kids like, like, is this a living book or is this twaddle? And I think that we have kind of been, it's like we haven't exposed our kids to high quality literature and story 
So then they don't develop a taste for it. So then we believe a thing about kids that they don't like it. They just want to be entertained. So then we write things for them like Dogman and Captain Underpants. Fine, totally fine if you love those books. They're just examples of a type of, of book that's, that's made for kids because we have this idea that it doesn't matter what a child's reading as long as they're reading. And that's the same thing as saying, it doesn't matter what you eat as long as you're eating calories. It's like, no, the quality of a calorie, a calorie is a calorie in some sense, but there are, <laughs> if you eat a bunch of fast food versus a bunch of like healthy, <laughs> healthy food, your body composition is going to be different, right? Even if you ate the same number of calories. Yes. But my argument, my argument to that too, is what if a kid reads nothing? Is it better that they read at least something, right? And then maybe we can graduate them to more rich So literature. here is my, I, I fully admit I have a pretty extreme view on this and there's a wide range of you're going to do what's best for your kid. And maybe that journey works great for your kid. And that's awesome. And I won't make fun of Captain Underpants or anything like that. But um, I will say that I don't see that trend broadly. What I see is that we teach kids basic phonics. We give them Captain Underpants or a book that looks, has big pictures, big font, and a subpar, simple story plot. We've taught them now, here's what I think you're capable of. And then they believe, okay, so I'm going to open a book like Charlotte's Web. No pictures, small font. I'm actually incapable of this. That's a hard book. When really, if we taught them the real, if we'd, if we'd been cultivating their love of story, their language comprehension, and then we taught them how to decode words so that they, whenever they looked at those harder words, or just because the font is smaller, they would be capable of sounding that out. And there's kind of, this is like kind of a marketing trap that we get caught in because there's so many books that are written for early readers, where if you really taught them how to read, they can skip that. <laughs> So while reading those books is fine, I don't think it's going to damage anyone. It kind of pulls them off the, the track, like a higher track that they could be on. And it doesn't mean that that track won't eventually meet up with high quality literature. It's just that I see more kids get caught in a trap of, I need more like things that feel easy to me um, because now I have this limiting belief and I don't, I haven't been fought. I haven't, um, been developing my appetite essentially for complex plots and storylines and being able to listen, to attend to listening without looking at something like that's another huge cognitive skill that I think our youth are really missing, which just then decreases their access essentially to all of like the wonderful conversations, very high level conversations, cognitive ideas that the rest of humanity has been talking about for hundreds of years. You can't really access that great conversation if you're kind of caught in this dogman level um, reading. And I, I was going through, and they're funny. I, I'm not saying that like you shouldn't read them. I'm just saying that that's maybe something that you want to think about is going towards a more living book um, path. And if you, if you really teach someone how to read, essentially we're getting caught in this trap here where we don't teach kids how to read fully, right? So they're not, they're only capable of like, you know, they can read at like a 60 or 70% level. There's all of these words that they can't access. And then we're giving them books at that level. And then we're not teaching them how to access anything higher. So then we just kind of have to keep that, that reading level the same. And that's where we see, like, that's where the two thirds of kids at a basic reading level is happening. Like that's what the data is showing. Um, and you can take my opinions and not believe them, um, but that's kind of just what I see. And if you have a reader that only wants to read Dogman and Underpants and those kind of books, there's lots of ways that you can help cultivate this love of richer language and literature. And what we started doing is just reading. We're reading this saga, this series. Oh my gosh, the language is just incredible. And I love it too. And I just started reading out loud. Then my son would pick it up. He just was so into the story that he picked it up himself. I could not get him to open up a book that had all the little small font, you know, because of all these graphic novels, but he wanted, he was so into the story that he 
wanted to read that. So just starting reading to them and giving them, like Katie used the word access and having that available and not just thinking, oh, well, they're not even going to pick it up because there's no pictures in it. Absolutely. You have to, you have to believe that a child is capable of something greater than maybe you're seeing in just one of my favorite sayings is just because something is common doesn't mean it's normal. So right now we have it to be very common that kids in third, fourth, fifth grade are reading these types of books. It doesn't mean it's normal. If we'd given them a proper introduction into a love of story, we've been training their hearts and minds to be able to attend, to listen and to love these stories. Then when we give them Charlotte's Web or something like that, then they're like, oh, this feels like a me thing, right? Instead of like, oh, this is for other kids that have these skills. And I'm not one of these kids that has, you know, it's, it's, it becomes like a person thing, like a self-identity thing. And I think it's important from an early age to teach kids who they can really become and have really high expectations of them. Yes. And tapping into their interest and, you know, with my son, he loves to be different. So I found all these books on thrift books that were written in the 1800s, early 1900s, and they smell fabulous. <laughs> and he just likes it because he's different. It's like no one else my age is reading these, you know, so it's like I'm tapping into, okay, how can we expand? And you use the word appetite, which Charlotte Mason talks about it being a feast. It's like all, yes, which I love thinking about it in that way. And a great resource to start learning how to read aloud or what books to read aloud to your kids is Sarah McKenzie. And she has a podcast and blog and website and all the things. It's called Read Aloud Revival. And she's actually the one that really encouraged me to read even to my teenager. And we have been reading aloud for a very long time, though. It's not like all of a sudden you know, I'm just reading to him or we've always been listening to audiobooks in the car instead of the radio or instead of watching a movie. When we go on trips, we try to listen to books, but she really encouraged me like, Hey, this is still really good. Even for your older kids to be listening uh, to you reading. And then that helps them. Like I said, with my middle son is to want to pick up those books and read them themselves exactly. as well. And she has a really good book called The Read Aloud Family, which talks about how to kind of reset the culture in your home around reading out loud. If it's not something you've done, it's not too late. It's the perfect time to start. And I, she also has really good book lists. And I also have a good book list. I'll link in the show notes. Um, if you're wondering like, well, then what do I read? Um, we'll give you some helps for that for sure. Okay. So we were figuring out the language comprehension piece and why that's so important. So now what about this second part of how do we get this right and teaching kids how to read? Right. So in order for them to become competent decoders, we really need to go back to basics on how we're approaching just basically teaching how to sound words out. Um, and I'm not saying that we're, we haven't been doing that at all. I'm saying we haven't been doing that enough. We don't go far enough. Um, and when I was in college, I was reading a story about this old woman who taught a bunch of people how to read. And I just had this really powerful moment where I just thought like, I need to make my entire life about that, just helping solve this problem in the world. And like, I just fell in love with the problem of solving illiteracy in the world. So I just think it's so empowering for an individual to have access to our world through literacy. And if you don't have that, it's just everything in your life is going to be hard. Um, so this is something that I'm super passionate about. And when I met Kelly Smith, our founder, um, Prenda, he's, he'd just done one semester, a pilot semester of a micro school in his house. And it was all for older kids. And I had little kids and that I wanted to do Prenda with. And so I had to kind of put together how, how might we in a micro school teach kids how to read at this super deep level. And if you haven't studied or like looked into print at all, we don't require that a guide of a micro school have any sort of educational background. We provide all of the curriculum direct to students so that you can be that guide on the side and help scaffold and um, like move kids through curriculum, but you don't actually have to instruct or teach. So then I looked at the market for available reading curriculums 
And I thought, what could we use in a micro school? And I didn't see anything. There are lots of really good programs that teach this deeper level of literacy, um, but not in a way that doesn't require an adult who knows what they're doing or is going to give individualized one-on-one -on -one instruction, um, which doesn't fit the Prenda micro school setup essentially. So um, the, the task at hand was to create a program based on all of this research and science that would move a child from not being able to read at all to being a very strong, competent reader um, without relying on a, on, a, on a trained adult getting them that instruction. So we built something, it's called Treasure Hunt Reading. Um, it's my magnum opus in my, <laughs> my life probably. <laughs> um, so essentially what this program does, it's, there's a workbook and there's a video, videos for each page in the workbook. So that instruction piece is delivered by me as a venture cake. Um, in a fun, engaging way. And then your child follows along with the videos and the workbook. And we go from not knowing anything about reading to reading at a third or fourth grade level. And the important features of this program and why what sets it apart from other approaches is that it's mastery based. So you're not just going to fill out a bunch of worksheets and then move on. Like if you need to do, if you, if you haven't mastered that skill, if you're not applying it, you're going to stay there and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, put forth all the effort you need to learn that principle before you move on. So mastery based, super important. Another thing that happens with literacy programs a lot is they'll teach some phonics, but then they'll ask you to apply that by reading something. And in your reading, you're asked to use skills that you haven't learned, right? So it's like, we haven't learned TH or the sight word the, but now we have a story and the is in it. So it's like, oh, well, I thought I was supposed to sound this out and now I can't. And that undoes a lot of the teaching that we have worked so diligently to accomplish. Um, so Treasure has, has a highly controlled, decodable vocabulary. So every lesson builds on the last lesson. Um, so you're definitely getting all of the things that you've learned reinforced and cycled through but you're never going to see something that you haven't learned, which is really important because kids need a very systematic, clean way of engaging with a very complicated thing, which is the English language. Another thing that sets, us, sets Treasure Hunt apart is that we only teach real sight words. And I know we've mentioned sight words, but maybe we just take a minute here. Um, a sight word is essentially something, a word that there's two definitions, and this is conflated in the balanced literacy approach a lot. Broadly speaking, a sight word is just a word that you should know on sight. Either they're so common, this is how you become a sight word. One, you're so, the word is so common that you want to be able to read that quickly, or it breaks some sort of rule. It's an exception to the rules of English. Um, so it can, you'll have to memorize that because it doesn't, you can't use your knowledge of the English language to decode that or break it down. So that is a true sight word. And that's all we teach in Treasure Hunt. We only do true sight words because we know that through phonics and exposure and practice, you're going to already become fluent at those decodable sight words. So there's no reason to give you a list of them to memorize. That's going to happen naturally um, if we stick with the process. And then this is maybe my favorite part of Treasure Hunt. Uh, I will show you in here. Sorry. So every lesson has, can you see this? This is like a little story, like a comic book. You'll notice that there's no pictures though, because I tell the kids in the video that my illustrator got captured by pirates and they have to illustrate my stories for me. So that means that there's no picture guessing and they have to read the text, the completely decodable text that they are perfectly capable of applying all of their knowledge um, to decoding. And then they have to illustrate that picture. So if it says that the boat was red and they draw a boat that's green, you can be like, hey, what color was this? You can go back to the text and draw that kind of comprehension tie. Um, so that's really fun. And then my favorite part of the videos is just the opportunity that I had as Adventure Kate to kind of scaffold um, the child's relationship with themselves as a reader. And I teach them that it takes courage and patience to learn to read and that it takes a million mistakes to learn how to read. So there's growth that built into all of the videos. And um, so not only is your child learning how to decode, but also kind of getting a little coaching on how to see themselves as they're making lots of mistakes, um, which is something that I've, I've seen in my kids as they've gone through the program. Um, 
just, I can hear them repeating Adventure Kate's words. And that's kind of become part of their internal voice about how they talk to themselves, about how they make mistakes and, and how they persist. And um, so I think that's a really valuable part of the program too. And it's free. It's free. That's so exciting. And what's really cool is even though you're on video, you create such a strong connection with these kids because I've been with you when we go into micro schools and to see these little ones just run up to you as if they know Adventure Kate is so incredible. So you're creating this connection through the computer, which is really hard to do. So kudos to you and the program. And I know when I first started with Prenda, it was like in one of the early iterations. And so it's come a long way to where it is now. So it's free, but where can people get this? So if you go to treasurehunt.prenda.co, you're going to see all the videos for free. You don't have to give an email, nothing. It's just completely free. If you click on for helpful adults, there'll be a download the workbook button. You can click on that and it will immediately just give you a PDF of the workbook that matches the videos. And you can take that to Kinko's or wherever you get things printed and print it out. You can print it off a sheet at a time at home or you can also purchase a copy on Amazon. We'll put all these links in the show notes as well. Um, and it's pretty cheap. So I'm excited to be partnering with Amazon on that because it's making access to this program so much easier than it would be. We also have a Facebook group that we just started uh, called Treasure Hunt Reading where you can pop in and um, ask questions. I will like make videos for you and explain the concepts if, if, you're, if you have a really specific struggle or issue. Um, I also love saying hi to the kids and cheering them on and hearing about their progress. So um, the Facebook group's really fun. That's amazing. I love that we were able to provide it for free for people because like I said, we've used it. And even though my littlest one has not been in a micro school, we just did it over the summer and he loves watching the videos. And also there's this sense of like independence, like, oh, I get to learn how to read and I'm doing this on my own. It also really serves the self-directed learning envi environment really well because you don't have to wait for your teacher. You're moving at your own pace. And things like that. And I actually watched, um, so I have a six-year-old who just finished the program last year. She's in first grade. It usually takes about like kindergarten and first grade for them to finish the program. But if they've done it well, they'll read at a third or fourth grade level. So you can skip the whole dogman phase and just give them Charlotte's Web and they can read it. And it's really empowering. Um, but I didn't help at all. I did this little experiment where I never engaged with her. She just did it at, at her micro school. And then at home, her nine-year-old brother would help her. So I watched my nine-year-old teach my five-year-old how to read through this program. So it's like very accessible and um, just so empowering. I love that you said, just skip the dog, man. I know my kids actually did at that age. They, like I said, they learned how to read so fast because they learned in this way. And I didn't even know it was, I was the feeling like the odd one out because all my friends were saying their kids at school that we're not teaching kids how to read this way, but they skipped right to Harry Potter. We didn't even know my 11 year old, now 11 year old could read because he wouldn't even practice with us. So we never heard him sounding out words or anything. And he picked up Harry Potter and I said, Oh, do you want me to read that to you? He's like, I'll read it to myself. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so empowerment. I mean, that's what we're talking about here, right? How incredible is that? And, and he still tells people, you know, that story. I read all the Harry Potters before, which some of them when at that age, <laughs> you know, it's a little over his head, but Hey, power to him. Okay. So let's wrap up. This has been so fascinating and I just love learning what we can do about this problem. We have a problem. Kids aren't reading. They're not literate. So there's lots of resources and ways that, and there's no excuses because it, you know, even if you start with treasure hunt reading, it is free and it's accessible to all readers, which is amazing. Okay, so we do have a question from a, lit a listener. Um, how does age-mixed education really work? It seems so crazy to have more than one grade level in a class. How can one adult manage the learning of kids at so many different levels? This comes from Taj in California. I have a child in a Montessori environment and or a Montessori school, and Honestly, I feel like the mix age works better. He started in just a, a environment where it's only kids his age, and then he moved into this mixed age environment. 
And it's like the older ones are helping the younger ones. So there's not as much, I feel like, pressure on the educator or on the teacher. And I've seen such a decrease in competition because a five or six-year-old is not going to be competing with a two or three-year-old. Even at that level, they're able to understand, oh, look, there's such a different level than I am. So I'm going to help them. And then now he just moved into the elementary class, which is first through sixth graders. And now he's on the younger end and he's getting to learn all these amazing skills by the older kids. So honestly, I feel like it's the opposite. (laughs) It seems so crazy to have kids just all in the same age in one class, but that is because it's how we've been doing it for so long. Yeah. I will say that even in, even when all the kids are nine, there are a lot of different levels of learning in that class. You have if you have 30 kids in that class, you have 30 different learning levels. So it's already complicated, but it's just not being managed well because you're only as a teacher, the curriculum of and like learning approach is that the teacher disseminates the information, which means there's only kind of one level that can be broadcast at a time, which is only going to work for about a third of those kids. Um, maybe you've heard the term teach to the middle. Um, and then you try to differentiate your instruction for your higher and lower um kids. And I mean, that, what if, what if we could take all of those learning minutes and have them be completely differentiated? And because of things like adaptive software, um, programs like treasure hunt reading that are built to be accomplished individually, mastery based education, essentially. And I will say like technology supported mastery based learning, um, or peer tutoring, like Adrian is talking about, um, creates a space where, the teacher is not responsible for, I'll quote the question, managing the learning of the kids. The kids are managing their learning and the the teacher is giving them the tools and the resources and helping them manage those tools and resources to um, accomplish their individualized goals. So in order, I wouldn't ever say like, let's keep traditional, the traditional classroom the same, but let's mix the class, the ages. That's not what we're saying at all. What we're encouraging is a, a totally different approach to the curriculum and manner of instruction that is more individualized, personalized, um, and adaptive. And then that's what creates uh, the opportunity for age mixed learning to go well. So in the example Adrian gave in a Montessori classroom, the kids are doing individual works is what they're called in Montessori that get progressively more difficult. And then each child also expands the different types of works that they are um, learning how to do. So the approach to learning assumes that there's not one level of learning happening in that space. And so that I'd say is what makes age mixed learning work. Yes. The environment is key in that. And Honestly, too, you can sometimes have mixed age if you have an eighth grader and a kindergartner, and it could get a little tricky. So environment, again, is really big in making that work. And the mindset of the educator, I think, is really being able to figure that out. I've walked into a micro school where it has been kindergarten through eighth grade, and at first it was complete chaos. But then the guide was able to figure out, oh, you know what? This eighth grader actually wants to be a teacher when she gets older. Let's tap into that. And then she took a group of kids and they got to work on something. So like what Katie's saying is that mastery base, it's more individualized. As an educator, you can say, I want to do age mixed learning, but I don't want it to be K through eight. I want it to be K through two or third through fifth. So you can limit the range. So it's kind of in a certain ballpark and that tends to go pretty well. That's what we see in Montessori. That's what we try to do in Prenda. Um, And there are benefits and struggles to spreading that age range out too far, I'd say. Like you get a lot more peer mentorship, but sometimes the whole group is not as enriching for either uh, younger kids or older kids when the grade span is too wide. And that's something that's going to be totally individualized to that specific group of kids. Um, So you kind of have to play that one by ear. Absolutely. Okay, so that is it for today. This was so packed with lots of goodness. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Kindled Podcast. If this episode was helpful to you, please like, subscribe, and follow us on social at Prenda Learn. If you have a question you'd like us to address, leave a comment or email us at podcast at Prenda.com. 
The Kindle podcast is brought to you by Prenda. Prenda makes it easy for you to start and run an amazing micro school based on all the things we talk about here on the Kindle podcast. If you want more information about guiding a Prenda micro school, go to Prenda.com and take our free mini course, The Beginner's Guide to Microschooling. Thanks for listening and remember to keep Kindling.